Chapter Three: Innate Needs. Let every word you speak be a gift to the person you're speaking to. My late mentor Florence Littauer said that decades ago, and it has stuck with me ever since. You probably agree with the sentiment of the statement: focus on saying kind things and avoid words that are unkind. But let's be honest. When it comes to communicating with kids, 99.9 percent of what comes out of your mouth isn't necessarily kind or unkind. They're just words. Think about what you said to your child this morning. Did it sound like this? Time to get up. Grab your backpack. Don't forget your lunch. Did you brush your teeth? Who left the milk out? Consider what you said to the students in your class yesterday. Turn to page forty-three. We're having a pop quiz. I've asked you twice to quiet down. Who can tell me the theme of this essay? What words did you say to the boys on your lacrosse team at practice? I expect to see some hustle today. Let's run that play again. Where's my defense? Four laps around the field. Go. Communicating with kids is mostly a game of logistics. More often than not, our words are instructions or corrections when those instructions aren't being followed. So, is it even realistic for every word to be a gift when you're just trying to tell your child to put on their shoes and get in the car? Actually, yes. I'm going to tell you how, but before I do, let me make a case for why it's so important. What words have stuck with you? When you think back to your childhood, was there something an adult said to you, good or bad, that you've never forgotten? Maybe you overheard your mom tell her friends that you're bad at math while asking if they knew a tutor she could hire. All these years later, you still believe it. Perhaps your dad declared you're so hard-headed while teaching you to drive as a 16-year-old. And you've worn that label ever since. On the flip side, maybe a coach celebrated your hustle, even though your talent only got you in the last two minutes of the game, or your drama teacher said you nailed it during rehearsal, and you can still feel the swell in your chest when you think back at that moment. Words are powerful; they have the potential to shape your self-image. In fact. They probably already have, and you've never really stopped to think about it. What those examples and your own from your childhood have in common is that they weren't big, momentous conversations. They weren't the halftime pep talk in the championship game of your senior year. They likely weren't part of the milestone talk like the awkward birds and bees lecture from your parents. They were embedded in ordinary, everyday conversations. That means, as an adult, the opportunity you have to positively influence your children with words is practically limitless. Just think of how many run-of-the-mill conversations you have each day with the children in your life. Yet, the opposite is also true. Every day, with every word you speak to a child, you run the risk that a casual comment will not only hurt, but will stick with them for life. So, how do you know what to say to help and not hurt? Temperament. What you'll hear in the following pages will be a game changer in every conversation that you have with a child from this day forward. In fact, if you forget every other word that I've said in this book, consider committing the next few pages to memory. You won't regret it. Let's do a quick recap. So far, we've covered four temperaments: sanguine yellow, choleric red, melancholic blue, and phlegmatic green. From this point forward, I will refer to each temperament by their assigned color. Hopefully, you've had a chance to hear directly from the kids of each temperament from the videos on my YouTube channel. If you'd like to commiserate with a few adults about what it's like to parent, teach, or coach these kids, you can also watch the full video sessions there or at kindwordsarecool.com/backslash/videos. Temperament determines a child's interest, behavior, and tendencies. 
It shapes every word they speak and how they hear every word spoken to them. Remember those two toddlers who were told to stay away from the stove? One obeys, the other does not. I hope you're catching on that children behave and respond differently depending on their temperaments. In this chapter, we're going to talk about why that's important. What is it that makes one child heed caution while another sees a test of wills? The answer can be found in the next part of the temperaments framework as we move on to the concept of innate needs. This is the secret of knowing which words will land well and which will do damage. It's a heady concept at first, but you'll make quick sense of it. Hang with me. Here's how I explain it to my clients. Imagine that every child has a love tank, similar to your car's gas tank. Just as you fill your car's tank with gasoline, you fill a child's love tank through words and actions that meet their temperament's innate needs. Each temperament has four innate needs, and we'll get to those in a minute. When you're doing and saying all the right things, the child's running smoothly, just as your car would be on a full tank of gas. In other words, they are operating out of their strengths. Yellows are optimistic and encouraging. Reds are influential and decisive. Blues are thoughtful and analytical. Greens are considerate and generous. But let that gas gauge hit E and your car starts to sputter. The same thing happens with your child. When their innate needs are not being met, they sputter too responding and behaving out of the weaknesses of their temperament. Yellows are interruptive and dramatic. Reds are inflexible and selfish. Blues are suspicious and moody. Greens are stubborn and sluggish. A full tank equals operating out of strengths. An empty tank equals operating out of weaknesses. Make sense? Here's one more important note about innate needs before we look at what they are for each temperament. Just as your car needs a constant supply of fuel, your child needs a constant supply of these innate needs. Doing and saying the right things occasionally won't keep their love tank full permanently. So it's important to learn the innate needs of each temperament and then say words that will fill their innate needs daily. Okay, on to the good part. Each temperament has four innate needs. The definitions I've given for each are built on decades of listening to both adults and children talk about their innate needs. Consider them generic though. For example, a blue child needs space and silence. To one child, that might mean a dark, quiet room. To another, it could mean zoning out while playing video games. Knowing what the innate needs look like for your specific child could be the difference between saying the right thing and saying the right thing the wrong way. Let's look at yellows first. The four innate needs of the yellow are approval, acceptance, attention, and affection. This is how I've come to define each of the innate needs. Approval, being liked for who they are without needing to change. Acceptance, being invited or included. Attention, having your full focus, especially eye contact. And affection, being noticed or acknowledged. If you'd like to see what yellow innate needs look like in real life, I'd love to introduce you to a yellow friend of mine. Search for yellow innate needs on my YouTube channel. For now, let's move on to the reds. The four innate needs of the reds are loyalty, sense of control, appreciation, and credit for work. Loyalty is often defined as being prioritized or knowing you have their back. Sense of control, everybody pulling their weight and following the plan. Appreciation, being valued for their unique strengths. Credit for work, being valued for their contributions. My YouTube channel has a great video of red kids explaining their innate needs. Just search for red innate needs. Now for blues. The four innate needs of the blues are safety, 
sensitivity, support, and space and silence. Safety is defined by being able to trust their surroundings and relationships. Sensitivity means being understood. Support, being offered or provided help. Space and silence, having time to decompress, process, or think. If you're curious to hear from kids on what needing safety or space and silence sounds like, search for Blue Innate Needs on my YouTube channel. Lastly, the greens. The four innate needs of the greens are harmony, feeling of worth, lack of stress, and respect. This is how they're defined over decades of listening to people in my office. Harmony, everyone getting along or everything going smoothly. Feeling of worth, being valued for their unique strengths. Lack of stress, an absence of conflict or combative words. Respect, being asked for their thoughts and opinions. Are you curious what stresses out a green child? Search for Green Innate Needs on my YouTube channel. I interviewed several green kids. I'll let them tell you. You can find longer definitions and example phrases for each of these innate needs in part two of A Grown-Up's Guide to Kids Wiring. You may have noticed as you listen through these lists that culture sends mixed messages about many of the innate needs. We're told that needing control makes somebody bossy, or that needing sensitivity makes a person weak. As a result, lots of kids are being saddled with some degree of confusion or shame about and around their innate needs. It's easy to see how a yellow's need for attention could get them labeled as hyperactive, or how a green child's need to avoid stress could make them appear lazy. Let me be clear, children are hardwired for these innate needs. Not only is it okay for the kids to crave these things, it is vital that they get them. Innate needs are designs, not defects. Let me repeat that again. Innate needs are designs, not defects. Your mission is to help them fill their innate needs in the healthiest possible way. Long before they are even conscious of it, children are trying to fill the innate needs of their temperament. Ideally, they do this with their strengths. A red toddler drags a chair twice her size over to the pantry in search of snacks. She is self-directed, adventurous, and has thought through the plan. There's no need for mom's help. She's got things under control. A yellow toddler enthusiastically waves to the guy behind the deli counter, hollering, hi, hi, hi. The child is people-oriented, cheerful, energetic, and won't quit until he gets some attention. A green kindergartner gives up her seat in the cafeteria to put an end to her friends fighting over who sits where. She's easygoing, accommodating, and knows how to bring harmony to the situation. A blue first grader watches cautiously from the ground as his classmates climb a tree on the playground. He's aware of the danger and can see all the ways this situation could go wrong. He decides to stay where he is because that seems like the safe choice. These instincts to take charge to win somebody's attention, to end a conflict, to be cautious, are innate. Children are hardwired for these responses. No amount of convincing or shaming is going to get that blue first grader up that tree. It's why trying to fix a child or break them of these behaviors is futile. Sometimes their strengths don't yield the response the child's hoping for. Maybe mom stops the plan and grabs the chair, or the deli guy just isn't paying attention because he's too busy. What happens then? Kids can slip into using their weaknesses, which might look a lot like the frustrating, repeated behavior you've been trying to correct or change. A red toddler now bosses and bullies everyone in the house. 
I want a snack now, just to exert her control. The yellow toddler tries screaming in the grocery store to get the attention he seeks. The green student lets her friends make all the decisions just to keep and maintain harmony. The blue first grader tattles on his classmates for doing what he believes isn't safe. Bottom line, kids will find some way to fill their innate needs. When strengths are not doing the trick, they'll subconsciously move on and try one of their weaknesses until they get what they are craving. This is why your words are so powerful. Every day, with every word you choose, you can fill a child's innate needs. And the more filled up their love tank stays, the better their behavior will be. That's probably motivation enough for most grown-ups. After all, who doesn't want better behaved children? Let me raise the stakes just a little bit more. Because there is a price to pay for ignoring your child's innate needs. Imagine a yellow teenager wired to need attention and affection. In her strength, she's charming and magnetic. She tells hilarious stories from the school day and her whole family loves listening and laughing along. Now, imagine a yellow teenager who doesn't get the attention and affection at home. Mom and dad are busy. Her stories and energy are exhausting. No one is giving her the attention she craves. What then? Remember, she will find someone or some way to fill that innate need. Who do you think that someone might be? Where do you think a teenage girl might turn for attention or affection? I've counseled way too many dads through the years who have watched their daughter's innate need for attention drive them into unhealthy habits and towards unhealthy people. Temperaments are not gender-driven. A yellow boy will follow the same path. The heartbreaking thing is that it's totally avoidable. The solution is as simple as your words. Let's go back to what Florence Littower said all those years ago. How do you make every word you speak a gift to the person you're speaking to? You consider your words in light of the child's innate needs. You still ask your red child to put away your laundry, but you fill her innate need for credit for work by acknowledging how efficient she was in the time it took. You realize that your yellow child wants to feel included, so you invite him to tag along on your neighborhood walk. You still require your green child to mow the lawn, but you agree to let them do it on Saturday afternoon after he's had a morning of chill. You consider that changing plans will likely ruffle your blue child, so you tell her as soon as possible and show sensitivity for the fact that she may feel frustrated. This way of communicating, choosing your words in light of the child in front of you, is more effective and efficient in the long run. You give the child what they are craving, and in return, they can actually hear you and obey. I know that's quite a promise, but I've seen it over and over again. Communicating through the temperaments framework benefits everyone. Give it a try right now and see for yourself. I'll give you a head start. Part two of the book actually includes dozens of examples of words and phrases for every age and stage that will fill your child's love tank. On that note, let's return to the gas tank illustration. What happens when your car begins to run low on gas? A warning light comes on. Kids have a warning light too. They are signals that their innate needs are not being filled. Understanding these signals will transform the trickiest and most frustrating parts of dealing with kids. I'll tell you the secret next. Keep listening. <laughs> 